When a John Fung taught meditation on the elements, we'd start with the breath first, and wouldn't have you go to any of the other elements until you'd really mastered the breath. This is a principle you find throughout the forest tradition. If you want to know the aggregates, focus on one of them, really get to know it. And then that knowledge will spread to the others. The same with the elements. Really get to know the breath element, how it responds to your mind, how it responds to your perceptions, how it responds to your directed thought and evaluation. You learn some important lessons in that principle that the Buddha put at the very beginning of the Dhammapada. Manopumagamatama. All phenomena have the mind as their forerunner. We tend to regard the elements in the body or the material side of the body as something that's already there. And then the mind moves in afterwards and deals with it afterwards. But if you learn to be more proactive in how you approach your body, you begin to realize that the mind plays a huge role in shaping your experience. How you perceive the breath is going to have a huge impact on how the breath actually feels. In other words, the images you hold in mind will determine how the breath flows. This is why it's really useful to have a John Lee's instructions on how to think about the breath. First, you just examine the different ways of breathing. In short, out short, in long, out long, in short, out long, in long, out short. And try to get sensitive to where you feel the breathing in the body. And then he would bring in the different perceptions. Think of the breath coming in the back of the neck. That's a very counterintuitive place. But for those of us who've had heart disease, you find that that's a really useful place to start. Because a lot of tension tends to build up there. So think of the breath coming in from the back. This is to counteract the perception that we already have about the breath coming in from the front. You have to pull it in from the front. You can create a lot of unnecessary tension that way. Now you allow it to come in from the back. That reverses the tension, cancels it out. And then think of it coming in there and then going down the spine. Then you have you think about it going out the legs, and then starting at the neck, going down the shoulders and the arms out to the tips of the fingers. In the front of the body, think of the breath coming in right out the heart, in the middle of the chest, and going down through the stomach and the intestines. And those are just the beginning. As you read John Lee's other Dharma talks, you see how we had lots of other ways of perceiving the breath. And John Fu had his own. I once tried to get him to write a book on breath meditation, because he had lots of different ways of thinking about the breath that I hadn't heard of before. The breath in the bones, the breath going in and out the eyes, problems with the breath could be solved. As he once said, when you start working on the breath, you will run into problems, but they can all be solved, except for one problem, is if you don't do it. So have that confidence. Something comes up, an imbalance in the energy, there's a way of dealing with it. If you feel like it's oppressive in the middle of the chest, think of that sense of breath there going out the arms and going out through the palms of the hands. If the breath energy seems to be collecting up in the top of the head, think of it going down the spine and then out into the out into the ground from the tailbone. And as you do this, you begin to realize that your perception of the breath has a huge impact on how it goes. This is why breath is 
an element in the body. The nature of the elements in the, in the Pali Canon, the word tattu, is that they can be provoked. In other words, they can lie latent, but then you can provoke them in various ways. Outside, you have the elements outside. There's a theory about how the wind element gets provoked and causes windstorms, the water element gets provoked, causes floods. The fire element, of course, can cause huge fires when it's provoked. And then they go still. The provocation goes and they go back to their latent state. You know, the elements in the body, the provocation can come from outside, but can also come from your perceptions, your thoughts. One of the reasons why we work with the breath first is because it's the most sensitive to what's going on in the mind. One thing you have to watch out for is making sure that you don't confuse breath energy with water energy in the body. Because, of course, the blood and the lymph move through the body, down the same channels that the breath moves. But the difference is, is the blood moves runs up against something solid, it stops, and the pressure can build up, whereas the breath can go right through. Think of how your atoms are mainly space. Someone gave me a book recently on the different sca scales, space, excuse me, space scales in space. Each page would magnify things more than more than a thousand, I've forgotten how many thousand times from the previous page. And the pages between seeing the atom and then finally getting to the nucleus, there are many, many pages of nothing, nothing, nothing. The nucleus is that small with relationship to the rest of the atom. It's all full of space. Energy can flow through there to hold that perception in mind. It helps get rid of a lot of the sense of blockage because you've been pushing the, the fluids in the body around too much and not enough of the breath. So there are ways you can create discomfort through different perceptions, but then you change the perception and resist the tendency to push things physically. Let the perception do the work. Then you find that you can solve those problems. So you really get to know the breath well. It's when you know one thing well that you can then transfer that expertise over to other things. If you try to know too many things all at once, nothing gets really known. You deal a lot with perceptions, ideas. And in terms of the books, it may be correct, but the whole point of the Dharma in the books is what the Buddha calls atta, A-T-T-H-A, which is the benefit that you get from that Dharma. Think of that time when the Buddha went out and he was in a Singsampa forest. He picked up a handful of Singsampa leaves and asked the monks, which is greater, the number of leaves in the forest and the leaves in the hand. Of course, they said that leaves in the forest were much greater. And the Buddha said, in the same way, what he had learned through his awakening, through his direct knowledge, was like the leaves in the forest. But what he had taught was like the leaves in his hand. He taught just a little bit. The reason he hadn't taught the rest was because they wouldn't lead to unbinding. But the leaves in his hand were the Four Noble Truths, and that did lead to unbinding. So the Dharma has its purpose, and to really know what the Dharma means, you have to know its purpose and experience the benefit that you get from it. That's when you really know. Prior to that time, it's all just concepts, and although it's useful to have the, the outlines of right view nailed down, still. It's possible to have too much 
book learning about things. The book learning is useful when you can figure out how the concepts apply to this experience right here. You, the breath, the awareness, the body, trying to get them all together. Looking for the potentials you have right here. Because there is a potential for ease, well-being in the breath. There is a potential for rapture, refreshment, fullness in the breath. This breath you're breathing right here, right now. If it's not pleasurable, okay, where is the potential for pleasure here? If you're not sure, back up and just watch for a while. Let the breath do its own thing. And then you feel your way. That's how the knowledge comes. But it really is your knowledge, not just somebody else's words stamped across your brain. You have the right vocabulary for it, but there's also an aspect to it that's more intuitional. You know without having verbalized what's working, what's not working. You can feel it. This is another aspect of John, of John Fung's teachings. Even though the books that he handed out, that John Lee's Keeping the Breath in Mind, had instructions on jhana, he never talked to his students about getting into jhana. He never certified who had which jhana. When people would come and ask him questions about their meditation, he would say, well, how does it feel to you? In other words, don't look at the words in the book. Look at how your feelings are responding to what you're doing. And learn how to read those feelings, finding out which feelings are actually telling you something important, which feelings are getting in the way. Noise in the system. You have to learn how to read that. And in areas like that, the best a teacher can do is say, well, this is what you have to look for. Ask these questions, and then you have to figure things out. But in figuring things out, that's how you develop your discernment. Again, it's not somebody else's concepts pasted across your experience. It's your sense of what works, what doesn't work, what actions are worth doing, which ones are not worth doing. And when you're tempted to do something that's unskillful, how can you talk yourself out of it? When you're too lazy to do something skillful, how can you talk yourself into being not lazy? That's the real discernment. And that has to come from you. So we're looking at the potentials of the breath. At the same time, we're looking at the mind's potentials for discernment, learning how to activate them. And the experience that's going to result comes from within here, too. There's nobody going to come in and give you their Buddha nature. The potential for awakening lies right here. An image from the forest tradition is wood that hasn't been polished. It has a grain, but the grain doesn't stand out. All you have to do is polish it. You don't have to add anything new, just polish it. And the grain will begin to st stand out and be clear. <laughs>